Hello and welcome to The Pulse. In part two of this week's show, how are we going to meet Hong Kong's future energy needs? But first, this week, the United States accused five hackers employed by the Chinese government of infiltrating American companies and stealing trade secrets. The Department of Justice is charging the men with a number of crimes, including economic espionage and identity theft. A Chinese foreign ministry spokesman, Chin Gun, says the claims, which involve companies at the heart of American business, are baseless, made up and hypocritical. Today we are announcing an indictment against five officers of the Chinese People's Liberation Army for serious cybersecurity breaches against six American victim companies. These represent the first ever charges against known state actors for infiltrating United States commercial targets by cyber means. The source of the alleged hacking appears to be a PLA unit based in Shanghai. U.S. intelligence has identified the five members of the Chinese military involved as belonging to Unit 61398. The companies hacked are mainly nuclear, steel and solar enterprises. In response to the United States claim, China has announced it will suspend cooperation with the United States on a newly set up internet working group. To the extent that we do not have that cooperation, we will use all the means that are available to us to ultimately have uh, these people appear in a federal court here in the United States, uh, in Pittsburgh, and be given due process of American law. Well, with us in the studio are Elizabeth Cheng of the Economist Intelligence Unit and Morton Holbrook, the Executive Director of the Hong Kong American Center. Elizabeth Cheng, can I come to you first? It, it seems to me that this is quite a serious low in, in Sino-US relations. Mm -hmm. We've just seen spokesmen from both sides saying mm -hmm. rude things about each other. Is this, in fact, a big deterioration? Does it represent a big deterioration in relations between the two countries? I think it's uh, probably um, following the usual pattern of U.S.-China relations in terms of comp compartmentalizing issues in order not to affect the general top priority economic uh, relations. So we can see that over the years, a lot of things have happened. Uh, I mean, both sides don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Uh, but they have never allowed the economic part to be affected. And I think this is a continuation of that. And it's actually good to um, focus on the cyber side instead of taking it uh, from the military point of view. So the, the U.S. is raising it to a commercial level, or rather demoting it to a commercial level, <laughs> and distracting it from the real military, uh, should there be, you know, or trying to avoid that kind of confrontation. Uh, uh, let me ask you, do you think this is all sound and fury not leading to anything in particular? Uh, I basically agree with Elizabeth. Uh, it, it's a kind of a normal crisis. <laughs> that U.S.-China relations have met uh, over the years, over the past 35 years, that pales in comparison uh, with the larger relationship, the economic relationship, the educational and cultural relationship. Uh, we have coming up uh, in, in just a couple of weeks, or a few weeks, the strategic and economic dialogue between top leaders in the U.S. and Japan, uh, sorry, U.S. and China. And uh, I don't see this affecting that. It'll take place. Or oh, perhaps the dialogue on cyber issues will not take place. One of the things, I think the Chinese do feel aggrieved. They do feel that they're also being spied upon. And, uh, you know, why are the Americans mm. making so much fuss when it's tit for tat? Do you, do you think there's some sort of equilibrium here? I think at this time, I think the timing itself is very interesting, isn't it? Uh, why now, especially when they, the U.S. is saying that they've been investigating for many years already. This is not something that we just heard about today. And then while they were investigating, Edward Snowden came and um, kind of messed up the stuff. Mm. Well, Ed, for... Edward Snowden, of course, came to <laughs> Hong Kong, which is under Chinese jurisdiction. And gave the Chinese a good bargaining chip. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, this was many months afterwards now. We're seeing this whole thing uh, coming up again with the U.S. actually making very visible <laughs> accusations, you know, with portraits of all these guys, you know, that they're naming. 
<clears throat> so the big question is why? Why? Why is the timing now? Have, is there things that are going around the world? Uh, some geopolitical consideration, Ukraine, Russia, uh, to try and strengthen the bargaining power of the U.S. Um, in relation to China? Well, I mean, it, it, I wonder if that is uh, uh, looked at from another side. I mean, you may argue that China is, is very publicly and actively pivoting away from the United States. We've had this state visit from President Putin, just ended. We have China in the United Nations regularly voting with Russia. I mean, do you think there is some sort of change in the way that they want to conduct their external relations? Uh, no, I, I think, uh, again, uh, the overall U.S.-China relationship is still sound. And if China wants to go off and be a good friend of the Russians, uh, that's fine with the United States. It's certainly nothing like the Sino-Soviet alliance in the Cold War. I think this case has been building for a number of years. And the U.S. has, has made statements in the past, uh, made these accusations in the past. Uh, having worked for the U.S. government for many years, I cannot say that the U.S. always carefully coordinates the timing of events like this. And I'd say there's a case to be made that it was simply random and happened to pop up. You think the time. Justice Department was just acting on its own, so to speak? Uh, I, I think there was a head of steam building there, and it would have taken uh, some force to push back on it. Uh, and especially that case, as I say, had been building for a number of years. And this Chinese unit involved, well, there were, there were pictures of it a couple of years ago in, in newspapers across the world. It's not, a, not something that uh, suddenly forced... You, you're talking about this so-called spying unit yeah, that, in, that, that in, in Shanghai. Yeah, in Shanghai, yeah. What do they call it? The con con converse? The yeah. But it is kind of um, unusual for just one unit to be involved, right? I mean, it, it, there's all these years of ga evidence gathering, and they only managed to pinpoint one particular PLA unit in Shanghai. What about all the others? Why is the hacking only done in that unit? And calls to mind, I mean, brings the question, brings up the question that that unit, is that unit involved in some personal or vested interest with these named companies that the U.S. has, uh, you know, those five uh, organizations? So, so, I mean, that I, probably the central authorities in China also wants to know, you know. What's but I think the other aspect of this, and, and yeah. I don't know what your take on it is, is it, it does seem that under Xi Jinping, China's foreign policy is more um, aggressive, is more focused towards asserting the, the high level mm. that China should um, take in, mm. in, in all international affairs. Kind of um, showing its muscle a bit here and yes, there. in Africa, yeah. In, yeah. in the United Nations, siding yeah. with the Russians, these sort of things. I mean, they've built up quite a lot of um, wealth now, and they're going to use it to the maximum political benefit mm -hmm. uh, and to um, secure their status in the world. Uh, and they, of course, want to do it peacefully, or at least that's what they say. They want to do it peacefully, and we have no evidence that they have been aggressive before. Uh, so this, I think, is probably also... Um, fits in with their new um, assertion in the um, East China and South China Seas, you know, uh, with territorial um, integrity, that sort of thing. So I think they see it as a global picture. Uh, where, whether they want to challenge the U.S. power, I mean, they're always saying that they aren't, you know, uh, in that area or have no intention whatsoever. Very briefly, because we don't have much time. I mean, do you think that America is sensibly dealing with what I think is fairly described as a new form of Chinese foreign policy? I think we are. Uh, that new form primarily is China reaching out to Africa, Middle East, Latin America for economic resources. You know, we, we have no problem with that at all, fair competition. Uh, at the same time, we see China more active in the United Nations in a positive sense participating in peacekeeping operations around the world, particularly in Africa. So uh, I think the United States is dealing with it uh, not as a, as a rival that must be kept down or contained, particularly not contained, uh, but as a, another large country that we treat with respect and we engage with on a number of issues, 
a few of which we disagree on. Well, thank you both very much indeed, and we'll be back after the break. Welcome back. Not so long ago, the Hong Kong government was considering a relatively high proportion of nuclear power generation to meet its electricity needs. The plan was to more than double the nuclear share in the mix, currently 23%, to 50%. Coal generation would be reduced from 54% to 10%. However, alarm over the Fukushima nuclear crisis has forced a rethink and the government is now conducting a consultation exercise about where our future energy supply should come from. Much of the debate about the current consultation on meeting Hong Kong's future power needs has been focused on the government proposal to buy electricity from the mainland. Currently, Hong Kong itself primarily relies on coal for power generation, supported by natural gas and nuclear power. However, it's proposed only two options for consideration, either buying 30% of our electricity from the China Southern Power Grid Company Limited, a state enterprise based in Guangzhou, or increasing the reliance on natural gas to 60% of the mix. In both options, the percentage of reliance on nuclear energy is similar. This kind of purchase from electricity grids is new to Hong Kong, and many are concerned about reliability, as well as political considerations. The revamp could also bring an increase in electricity bills and the need to build additional infrastructure. There'll also be a knock-on effect on the local electricity market, which involves the conditions for the future scheme of control agreement with the two power companies. The current one expires in 2018. Hong Kong Electric has said it's doubtful about buying electricity from the mainland and says it wouldn't be as reliable as local power generation. It also points out the price will be higher. China Light and Power, on the other hand, says both options have benefits but adds it would like to see more studies on cross-border power facilities. Nevertheless, the company does favour local power generation as being more stable and having more efficient emissions controls. Well, with us in the studio are Dr William Yu, CEO of the World Green Organisation, and Dr To Chi Hua of the School of Energy and Environment at City University. Can I come first to you, Dr. Cho? I mean, um, we, we, we've just heard from CLP that they are worried about the so-called option two here. Do you, do you share their same worries? Well, under option two, I mean, these scenarios, we are quite familiar with it uh, because we talk about uh, increasing the amount of natural gas for electricity generation to 60% and then we retain something like 20% of coal. Another 20% would be, the, as usual, the import nuclear. And this one is my only concern is that uh, it would uh, mean uh, this regime will carry on and it will be very difficult uh, later on to unbundle the supply chain. So that will be very difficult for later on the liberalization of the electricity market. But having said that, uh, what is wrong with the current regime now? We have the uh, almost the very cheap electricity tariff compared with Singapore and Tokyo. And our reliability and stability is number one almost in the world. And the performance of our units, I mean the power plant, is at world standards. So why people are not happy to have this regime Carry on. I think the reason they're not happy is because they think that there's a, there's a cartel operating electricity supply in Hong Kong and it's ripping off the customers. That's what is the perception. You're quite right. I mean, uh, okay, people won't have choice. All right. Another point could be, uh, I have to point out that maybe some people feel both power companies are making huge profit. Uh, look at the annual report of HUZ. 
uh, the Hong Kong Electric. Hong Kong Electric. So uh, the uh, business for hundred dollars, the profits nearly about forty dollars is quite huge. Some, a lot of people don't feel very comfortable about it. And let me come to you, Dr. to you. I, I, I mean, are you happy with any of these two options? Would you like to see the status quo maintained? I, I think we are offered two very polarized options, uh, which are not ideal, I would say, um, because now if we go for, say, option two, uh, we will face the current situation that people are not happy with the electricity tariff. So in the future, because there are only too few choice in each utilities, so what we are going to face is the huge price fluctuation in natural gas that really affects very much you know, the electricity tariff in the future. So people start to discuss about the market liberalization whether we can get a, a first supplier or more suppliers in order to bring, bring the price down. But is that feasible in a small place like Hong Kong? I, so that, that, um, that's the area we need to further discuss. If we make reference to the UK experience or the European you know, uh, kind of market reform, we, we will find maybe market liberalization might not be the only option you know, uh, to bring the price down. And in fact, in most of the case, the, the tariffs price went up instead of going down. So I, I think we, we need to think clearly what we are looking for. What is the purpose you know, of bringing different kinds of policy measures? So now, um, if we now want a, another supplier, then what should we do? Option one provides another supplier, but again, we have um, put emphasis on the reliability issues, whether they can uh, offer a very stable you know, kind of supply. Um, so we, we need to think clearly what, what are we looking for? Because if we want more competition, we need to bring in another supplier. I mean, I get the impression from you, Dr. Cho, that basically you're saying the status quo is fine. The yes, status quo is, uh, I mean, give us as uh, Dr. Yu mentioned about give you the confidence like the uh, stability, reliability, mm -hmm. and we know, uh, you know, the regime structures very well. The under the option is very new to us. Mm -hmm. There are a number of uncertainties uh, we have to address. Uh, for example, people always say that when you change something. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. That's right. Correct. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, when we, you know, we've been asking for changes, but there are always uh, a risk uncertainties. But if we have more information, uh, you know for this option one arrangement, then we feel more uh, confident uh, to make uh, you know, informed choice. The, uh, apart from the stability and also the reliability, we have to think about the sentiment of Hong Kong people. Now we've been importing water, substantial water to Hong Kong. Are we going to do the same for electricity? And uh, should we take care of our own uh, you know, water supply? Water supply? Yeah. Uh, remember now the government is talking about uh, building a new, uh, like this, uh, you know, seawater desalination plant to make uh, fresh waters. Okay, uh, and that's what I'm, I'm concerned about the sentiment of Hong Kong people. I, I, right. I just wonder, Dr. Yu, we haven't touched on this, and it isn't a major part of the argument at the moment. But Hong Kong ha seems to have very little discussion about alternative energy, renewable energy, that 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 area of supply. I I think uh, we. We have considered, you know, the offshore wind, wind farm, uh, one in Naipin Island mm -hmm. in Sai Kong, and other one in south of Lamma. Uh, but I, I don't think that would be a very feasible option uh, in the future. Um, first, that could increase uh, two percent of electricity tariff uh, by in investing in a few billion dollar, you know, to bring this very small percentage of renewable energy. Um, so from the cost effectiveness per pers uh, perspective, maybe this should not be a very popular option. Very briefly, Dr. Cho, because I know you in fact are an industry vet veteran, you used to work for Hong Kong Electric. What do you think will be the price impact of any changes? Well, it depends very much on, uh, uh, on the option one, option two. Option one, you, you know very well, that I mean that 30% uh, uh, of it is from uh, you know, mainland China and depends on you know, what Cost they charge us. Under option two, uh, the most important element is the gas price. 
Now, talking about gas price, because we are going to increase from what we have now, 23% to 60%, it's a huge amount of gas. Mm. And I'm thinking of why don't we have our own LNG terminal in Hong Kong, all right, we visit the LNG terminal for Hong Kong because we can have multiple sources, flexible sources, and then we have certain leeway to look at, to control the prices for us. So that will be, I think, that will be the best way forward to keep the cost down. Well, thank you both very much indeed, and I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Don't forget that if you've missed part of the show, want to see more, or even see it again, you can always go to the Pulse page on the RTHK website. And for the really keen, there are podcasts to watch at any time of day or night. Also, if you want to chat to us or tell us what you think, go to our Facebook page, RTHK's The Pulse. We'll see you at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>